Support for this podcast comes from GEICO. How would you love a chance to save some money on car insurance? GEICO can help. Switch today and see all the ways you could save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to GEICO.com to get a rate quote and get started seeing how much you could save. Hi, it's Megna here. And before we get to the show today, I just want to squeeze in a quick plug for the On Point newsletter. It's a peek into a future show, an invitation for you to contribute, plus a selection of show picks from our producers, all packaged up in one weekly email for you. So sign up at onpointradio.org. Now, on with today's show. This is On Point. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. And today, Rana Faruhar joins us. She is a global business columnist and associate editor at the Financial Times, CNN Global Economic Analyst, and you all probably know her best, I'd say, because we claim her as one half of the duo, along with Michelle Singletary, whom we lovingly call the On Point Money Ladies, because Michelle and Rana come on fairly frequently to give us their macro and micro economic analysis of issues that are hitting close to home. Now, on those Money Ladies shows, Rana has frequently talked a lot about building more resilient economies. In fact, just last week, we did a show inspired by something Rana had previously said about China's dual circulation policy. So today, we're going to look more deeply at what building more resilient local economies would look like here in the United States, because that is the focus of Rana's newest book. It's called Homecoming, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World. And Rana Fruhar joins us from Washington. Rana, great to have you back. Oh, Magna, it's so nice to be here. Thanks for having me. And I really mean it. We did a dual circulation um, <laughs> policy show last week, and it was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> so, I love it when I can push out wonky words into the world. That's like my favorite thing. <laughs> well, we're, and I'm going to talk ask you more about it in in a bit because. I want to hear your uh, comparison between of China's policy in the United States a little bit later, but. I wanted to actually start with something that you write at the very, very beginning of your book. Mm -hmm. Um, And it takes us back in time a little bit because I think it's important to set the stage in terms of how we got here. Mm. It's a story I'd never heard you tell before, and it involves a meeting that you had in the 90s, right, with Richard Trumka, who was then head of the AFL. And he had shared with you a conversation that he had with a Clinton administration Uh, economic policy advisor about what could happen if the United States agreed to NAFTA. And I'm just going to read a section from from your book here. Richard Trumka told you that, quote, he was concerned about a sudden flood of cheap labor into the global marketplace and the effect this would have on American workers' incomes and lives. And I told the official that the deals would kill us, he agreed. And he agreed, Trumka said. But he said that after a while, wages would start to go up again and the things would even out around the world. And then Trumka tells you that he asked the official, the Clinton administration official, how long this process of leveling out might take. And the, the official answered, about three to five generations. (laughs) Why is that so important to understand now? Well, um, it's funny. When, whenever I tell that story and as you're telling it, it's just like you take a deep breath yeah. when you hear it because you're like, wow, that's 100 years in people's lives. Um, to clarify as well, you know, Trumpka himself had that meeting in the 90s. He actually told me about it um, around 2014 mm, or so. Okay, um, okay. But, um, but, but same point. Um, this is important because we made a bargain in this country. Um, over the last certainly 20 years, um, you could put the marker even earlier and maybe we'll, we'll get into that. But as we deregulated um, our financial economy and also uh, moved into the global economy with trade deals like NAFTA and also allowing China into the WTO in 2001, we entered a new era of globalization. And part of the bargain of that era, um, this is, you know, what what policymakers and politicians told us 
was that we're going to get a lot of cheap stuff. Yes, we're going to send jobs abroad. There's going to be losses in some industries. But prices are going to go down because cheap labor from other countries uh, are going to do these jobs now. And don't worry, everyone. It's going to be better on balance because, you know, you're going to be able to buy so many low cost things in Walmart and your TV costs are going to go down and those iPhones are going to go down. And you know what? That did happen. But guess what? No surprise to anyone listening, I'm sure, that that did not make up over the last 20 years for stagnant wages, um, for the hollowing out of the industrial base, and for the fact that all the things that that actually you you need to be a middle class person, uh, housing, education, uh, health care in this country have been rising at triple the core inflation rate even before the latest bout of serious inflation mm. over the last few years. So I tell this story because I want people to know that that was the bargain and it was the wrong bargain. Yeah, well, they didn't make the bargain, right? I mean, no, it, that's right. That's right. But this is Washington did. Yeah, go ahead. That's right. That's right. And 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 I don't think we ever really got a clear human telling of of that bargain. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to do in the lead of the book. OK, it is just such a stunning story. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. I know it is. I've been saving it for this oh, book for yeah, that reason. Because, I mean, the, the, they knew <laughs> there was deep yeah. knowledge. Um, uh, in 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 policy making circles that there that people would be experiencing a period generational period three to five generations of a uh, period of ch- of pain essentially but right. uh, I don't see evidence of um, a thoughtfulness on what to do to help those people as that global transition took place but lo and behold here we are now in 2022 and thanks to a lot of fragilities in different systems I mean financial market yeah. fragility which obviously 2008. Um, we got a big wake up call on uh, supply chain fragility. The, co- the COVID pandemic helped uh, open our eyes to that political fragility um, as a you know, as an outgrowth of of that suffering over time. It's uh, I was going to say unignorable. Is that a word? It's yeah. unignorable that uh, <laughs> it is now <laughs> that um, something has to change. And in fact, in many countries around the world, there are active efforts to change that. How would you describe what that desired change is? Well, the way I describe it in my book, um, which is titled Homecoming, is really that. It's about finding a new balance between global and local. My basic take is that over these last many decades, the global economy uh, has become a bit of an end-all and be-all. It has taken so much more precedent than domestic concerns in not just in the U.S., but in many countries. Um, And so you've gotten a huge amount of wealth created um, because, you know, the last 50 years have done nothing except for enrich um, companies in particular in the top, um, you know, 1% of the population. But we haven't gotten a kind of a remooring of that wealth, uh, a sharing of that wealth in a way that we need to make people believe in the system. And this is my my big thing that I keep pushing. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why people don't have trust right now in institutions, in politics. Um, but I think one of them is that we have had the balance in our policymaking between global and local off. Um, the global economy went way too far ahead of national political concerns, and we need to reconnect those two things if we want to help people to believe in our system again. Mm. Well, obviously, the Biden administration is talking a lot uh, about strengthening supply chains, bringing some uh, in- sure. industries back to the United States. So let's let's dive into one um, uh, part of the economy that you focus on quite a bit in your book. And it surprises me, actually, Rana, because it's not mm. one I would have thought of. Food, mm. right? Food yeah. and farming. So yeah. I want to play for just a quick moment a clip from an interview that you did with uh, one of your sources who appears in the book. Uh, there's a series of videos along with your book that is appearing on the FT's website. So you talked to Joe Maxwell, an independent farmer in Missouri. He's also the president and co-founder of Farm Action, a group that advocates for change in agriculture policies. And he told you that big corporations dictate what most farms in the U.S. grow, and they're telling those farmers not to grow food for people, but for cattle. Now, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that we, we, we should quit raising corn and soybeans. I'm not saying that at all. But it shouldn't be all we're doing and raising it for a price that's below production cost. Yeah. And depending on taxpayers, 
to hold us up while we see uh, Brazil's JBS or China's Smithfield or U.S. Cargill, its corporate power around the world, has a lock on it, and they push farmers to uh, raise corn and soybeans, corn and soybeans, corn and soybeans. It's Joe Maxwell in Iowa speaking to Rana Faruhar. So, Rana, what is it about food production that makes it such a good example for not only globalization, but then the homecoming that you write about? Yeah, so, well, food is... It's something that touches us all, right? It, it just immediately connects to people. And the reason that I started thinking about this, particularly for this book about localization and, and kind of, you know, balancing global and local, was that when the pandemic hit, we had this real-time experiment in fragile supply chains and also highly concentrated agriculture and what that means. And so if you remember, you go back and pandemic hits, restaurants are empty, everybody's at home, um, but you can't find certain things in the grocery store. And so I started thinking, well, wait a minute, what, you know, there should be a sort of a, a rebalancing there where the food supply that was going to restaurants could go to grocery stores, g- g- grocery stores. No. Why? Because there are two totally separate supply chains, both hyper efficient. And I put that in quotation marks um, owned by about, you know, two or three companies, maybe four tops in, in both sectors. And they, you know, designed to be totally separate. So they're about just-in-time efficiency, but at a point of resiliency where you need flexibility, you need sharing, you need um, a, a diverse economic ecosystem, they start to break down. Then I started looking into, well, what is it about our agricultural system that, that has made it this way? And I realized that all the policy tweaks of the last several decades have basically pushed us into cash crop farming. So, you know, we're most of what we are growing, let's say corn, for example, that's a crop I know well because I, I grew up in Indiana. My first job was actually detasseling corn. Um, most of the corn in this country is grown not to feed people, but to feed cattle. That is about the heaviest um, emission heavy sort of thing that you can do uh, to to heat up the planet. I mean, that kind of agriculture is one of the number one reasons that we have massive climate change right now. So we've got all these incentives pushing us in a certain direction. So I go out to farm country and I traveled um, from Madison, Wisconsin, actually down to Missouri to talk to and through Iowa and down to Missouri to talk to Joe and his some of the small farmers there. And they said to me, you know, the system is so concentrated and so globalized that we can't even take our hogs and go six miles down the road to a school or a hospital and sell that meat. We have to go through three levels of middlemen, um, commodities traders, financial houses in order to do that. That is a broken market. Mm. Well, Rana Faruhar is with us today. She's author of the new book, Homecoming, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World. More in a minute. This is On Point. Support for this podcast comes from GEICO. How would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? GEICO can help, like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners or renters' coverage. Plus, add an easy-to-use mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more, and GEICO is an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save. It's easy. Simply go to geico.com or contact your local agent today. Support for On Point comes from Indeed. The world, just like your business, is changing fast. To find top talent fast, you need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Indeed's virtual interview tool means there's nothing to download. Just click and talk. After using Indeed's virtual interviews, most employers said it saved them days of hiring time. Visit Indeed.com slash on point to start hiring now. Indeed.com slash on point. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. This is On Point. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty, and today Rana Faruhar is back with us. She's talking with us about her latest book called Homecoming, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World. Rana, I want to talk more about food because, um, you know, you said it was a broken market when a farmer can't even just go down the street um, and sell and sell the goods this year he's growing. But yeah. on the other hand, though, you also described a system that was built for maxim- maximum efficiency. 
right? Mm-hmm. So, so can essentially <laughs> can can a system be both efficient and broken at the same time? Is that what we're seeing in food? You know that that's I'm I'm glad you sort of called me on the word. I mean, I use the word efficient. Um, we talk about efficient systems, and and in the corporate world, that means it's meant to be fast, it's meant to drive down prices, and it's meant to produce a lot of mass goods. And that, indeed, is what our agricultural system does if you count mass goods as calories. I mean, we are producing <laughs> way more calories than anybody in this country needs, but we actually have a shortage of the things that we need more of, like healthy, fresh produce. Um, you know, we have plenty of corn for cattle. Um, uh, we have plenty of corn to put in corn syrup for frozen foods, but we don't have enough um, healthy food. And that's because the system is incentivized to be, quote unquote, efficient um, and big and concentrated. Um, I was looking at the move, particularly during the pandemic, towards more local agricultural ecosystems. Um, one of the stories I came across, actually, I just touched it briefly in the book, but I've, I've since learned more. Alice Waters, you know, the, mm-hmm. the famous um, chef at Chez Panisse and one of the, you know, wonderful sort of uh, proponents of slow food, of healthier food, of more localism, is working to um, basically get the big middlemen food companies out of the school systems in California. You know, the, the kind of giant companies that come in and plop down the, the frozen um, lunches that we all enjoyed as children, probably many of us. Um, and to and to really um, you know make local predominant in the agricultural system, and it's totally possible. But you're fighting against corporate lobbies, you're fighting against incentives, and so this is something that's going to take time. But it is going to work out better. It's going to raise incomes, and it's going to make us healthier when it happens. Okay, so with, regarding that efficiency question, I mean, you write in the book that agriculture has become incredibly uh, efficient. U.S. farmers have tripled their production over the past 70 years, but it has come as at a cost to everything, as, as you yeah. say, our, our health, food security, working conditions for people, farmers' livelihood, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and par- but part of the reason um, for that efficiency, that now sort of um, the questionable efficiency, is comes with the, what Joe Maxwell told you because he mentioned some names that come up over and over again when we talk mm-hmm. about food. JBS, Smithfield, yeah. Cargill, the g- global food giants that control, what, 70, 80 percent of various forms of the food market in the United States. How, if we're going to, um, if we're going to move towards a more, uh, a, a better system, a more local system, it, it comes, you know, against the edifice of these enormous global food corporations. Yeah, and you could say that for almost every industry, and that's one of the reasons why the Biden administration is going after big food. Um, You know, there's major antitrust action going on in Washington right now. That's something we've talked about, I think, on this show before. Um, But one of the biggest areas of focus, and this definitely took off post-pandemic, is agriculture. You know, you saw the the, the big chicken companies, the big um, meat packaging companies really come under fire for working conditions, for um, the kind of cornering of the market that they've done over the last few years that has been incentivized by our system, which is meant to make everything cheaper. But cheap isn't cheap, Magna, when you think Mm -hmm. about the real cost of it to the environment, to our health, to our jobs. You know, I mean, remember those meatpacking workers and the just the disastrous conditions that they worked in? And we learned about that during COVID. It was, you know, it's like going back to the the Upton Sinclair days of the jungle. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing that's happening in so many different industries. And it's just something that we need to really pull back the lens and look on and say, is this how we want our market system to work? Yeah. Where does this end? Because it doesn't end with the meat packers. You know, it does not end with the meat packers. It, we're all we're all feeling the pinch. Mm. And there seems to be some perverse perverse incentives now built into the process of food production, right? Because you talk about the commodity treadmill uh, in the book, right? Where yeah. where um, there's just like this cycle where farmers, because they're struggling with all these low prices, um, they produce more of those commodities to try and, uh, according to an expert you talked to, to recoup their losses. But then it just like it, it's like a negative feedback loop. Right. Well, that, you know, you have to go way back actually to the 1930s to understand the whole system. And, you know, at that time, and this is true in so many economic paradigms, at that time, 
the system made sense. Great Depression hits. You have mass migration from rural areas into cities. Um, the country, as part of the sort of, you know, um, New Deal, get back on, on our feet program, incentivized just a ton of industrial farming to create cheap calories to feed factory workers, essentially, and the, the poor people that were flooding into the cities. That worked for a while. And then there was, of course, the exporting of, of a lot of those commodities overseas, many of them in sort of tit for tat trade deals that weren't always good for U.S. workers. Big companies get bigger, food gets cheaper, but obesity rises, healthcare uh, costs rise exponentially. Um, the land degradation is stunning. And, you know, Magna, I, as I say, I grew up in farm country. Mm -hmm. The amount of chemicals that you need to coax growth out of the same soil decade after decade when you farm in this way is really stunning. And I find it just such a metaphor for some of the perversities of the highly globalized, highly financialized system that we live in. It's, it, you know, if we look around and think for a minute, we, we would say, this actually isn't working all that well. It's degrading the very land that I live in, the nutrition of the plants that are being grown. Um, you know, the, the biggest, biggest um, cash produce item in this country, I don't know if you can guess, it is iceberg lettuce. Wow. Why is that? Iceberg lettuce is, to my mind, it's a vehicle for blue cheese, but maybe that's just <laughs> me. Um, but the reason that that is the top um, cash crop in produce is that it can be transported for six months in a truck uh -huh. and and still be edible. Now, whether you want to eat it is another thing. It also loses, you know, about 60 percent of its weight in which is water weight during that time. So think about that. Just like put on our logic caps and say, hmm, what are the economics of taking this 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 item that isn't actually that nutritious, that we farmed just because it can stay in one place for six months and still be edible, it loses half of its weight. So we're shipping something that's actually shrinking in size. We're spending the fuel. We're spending the emissions to do that instead of maybe just growing some more nutritious lettuce nearby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like it ain't rocket science, but, you know, we've talked about economics and how divorced it is from reality sometimes. Well, so the other day I was um, pawing through my freezer and I pulled out a bag of Trader Joe's frozen peas. Okay. Yes. And I looked on the back, and the you know even though the United <laughs> even though the United States grows a lot of peas, where did these frozen peas come from? They came from China. It's right. very fascinating how much, how far food moves uh, in order to get to our local grocery stores. Now, I oh, want to yeah. first of all acknowledge, though, that there, just to state this, that there are many places in the United States where people are living in food deserts, so their access to hundred um, percent different Often types of they're Oh, They're very close. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it's just so interesting because I I looked at those, and oftentimes food deserts are very very near to some of the biggest growing areas. So it's 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 about that globalization of the market. If you made it more local, there would be fewer food mm. deserts, I believe. Well, I want to talk about the trade-offs, though. Like, uh, you know, if we were able to, you know, bring food production and food consumption, um, shrink the distance between the two, mm. um, and we'll discuss a little bit about how in a minute. But there are trade-offs because you started this conversation about food by saying, yeah, well, we've become used to, even though food prices have been rising, especially the past couple of years, generally, you know, lower food prices, more affordable. Portable meat in particular. Mm. Um, and I would also add then uh, a produce availability regardless of what the season is. These mm -hmm. are all things that we have become used to. And I would say a lot of people actually rely on. So mm. what is the trade off for the end point consumer for the grocery store shopper if we were to, you know, shrink the, the length of the, the food supply chain? Well, we'd all be eating healthier for one thing, um, because a lot of the products that are coming from very far away, and I was I was I was smiling as you were talking about the peas from China. Don't even think about looking at the shrimp, the frozen shrimp in in your IGA, because that's coming from often from um, Vietnam, or South Thailand, China, yeah. Thailand, in places where the regulatory systems are just they're, they're non-existent. The level of chemicals, lead, uh, you know, all kinds of toxins in the. I mean, I don't even actually allow my myself or my children to eat them anymore after I've done some reading. Um, but but look. 
your point is an interesting one. There is a trade-off between resiliency and inflation, and, and we should get into that. There's also different ways of calculating what is cheap. You know, it, is, it, is it actually cheap to eat what we are being fed um, and what we're being incentivized to produce, be unhealthy, and then have a medical system in which we're spending literally double per capita the nearest nation, which is Switzerland, I don't think that's cheap. In terms of the people depending on food that's um, grown out of season, you know, it's interesting. Let's take um, berries, for example. That That's a good one, and it's, it's something I actually cover in the book. Um, Driscoll's, which is the biggest berry company, we all, you know, when you buy the little berries in the store, they usually say Driscoll's on them. Um, they're very worried about finding berries anywhere at any time anymore because there's only about three places in the world that you can grow them. And because of climate change, um, when there's a small impact, it makes a huge difference. You know, mm -hmm. essentially, I mean, I talked to the CEO of Driscoll's. He's like, you know, we can't if, if the if the climate moves a little bit, it changes uh, the growing patterns like 100 yards up a mountain. We can't grow the berries there. It's just not possible. So one thing that's being done is decentralized technology is being used to find ways to actually bridge that gap between local and global, between efficiency and resiliency. And vertical farming is an interesting um uh, point in that in that category. These are farms that grow on the sides of walls, on roofs. Google feeds most of its campus in California from vertical farms that are that are on site. Um, you know, they're not a silver bullet. There are certainly efficiency issues and energy usage issues there that need to be solved. But it's one way in which people are problem solving mm -hmm. around these trade offs that you talk about. Uh, but Rana, I, I guess what I'm what I'm wondering is. Um, uh, the 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 trade offs to achieve a more resilient system. What I'm hearing, though, and and it often comes down to this, is that we we might have to pay more, right? Whether it's for food or other consumer goods, things like that. But that's a very hard sell, especially right now, as you know, people are struggling, living paycheck to paycheck. The cost of food, uh, you know, it is going up. I'm just wondering, um, why should why should the average consumer be the one that bears the burden for the higher cost of a more resilient system? Is there anywhere else in that system any other stakeholders or players who could who could or should absorb the higher cost to build a stronger, more resilient system, a.k.a. the very corporations that are running the system itself? Uh it, indeed. And, um, you know, I'm glad you're using the word system because... Really what I'm talking about in this book is systems change. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you talk about, yeah, is it fair for the consumer to pay more? No, of course, nobody wants to pay more. I mean, I'm feeling the pinch of, of higher grocery prices. Many people are. But if you pull the lens back and you factor in the costs of cheap, cheap isn't cheap. We've been paying for cheap all along. We've we've all been paying for it in the fact that, it, let's face it, a globalized workforce drives down price, it drives down incomes, it drives down incomes in countries like this one. Now, you know, if you're a globalist, you could say, well, uh, you know, it's it's OK because people's wages are rising in Asia. Well, to a certain extent, although they're being often suppressed by the state, we can get into the politics of that. But the bottom line is we are paying for these things in some way. So pull the lens back. Yeah, I think what we need is systems change where corporations are paying higher taxes in order to uh, support a social safety net and underpin things like, for example, a more universal health care system or um, uh, higher wages so that you could actually grow food in a different way. Um, you know, I could go on and on, yeah. but that's what this book is about. It's essentially about a pendulum shift from neoliberal globalization. And I know that's a mouthful, but hey, if you can handle dual circulation, you can handle this. <laughs> um, ne neoliberalism is essentially the, the political philosophy we've been living in. It underpins our economy. It underpins globalization. And it's the idea that capital goods, people can go anywhere they want, and they're always going to go where it's best and most productive. That's the, that's, the, that's the invisible hand, right? That's the efficient market thesis. But the problem is money always travels a lot faster than goods or people. And so who has benefited most from um, the last 40 years, multinational corporations. Mm -hmm. They have seen the majority of the gains of wealth. And we have had incredible wealth gains, but we've also had increasing inequality in almost every country. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to get at. We need to change. Well, I'd like you to actually um, 
you put some shape around what an alternative food system might look like. I mean, you do yeah. write in the book that there's like no one silver bullet <laughs> yeah. for sure. But what would a what would you know homecoming regarding food give us an example of what what uh, what it could be? So um, I, I mentioned Alice Waters' uh, activism earlier, mm-hmm. and I think it's an interesting case study because she's blending a lot of different things. So community-supported agriculture, when it reaches scale, as it has in a place like California, prices do start to come down to a point where you're not going to the farmer's market and getting those boutique, you know, the, the cheeses that cost $20. I mean, you know, we can we can talk about artisanal farmer's markets. That's not a solution to a national food systems change issue. But when you start to get scale by creating enough space in the market, be it by antitrust policy, be it by having a critical mass of consumers in a high high growing area like California where you can start to do that, then you have the availability of a different market. Now, once you have some different market options, you can start to use the public sector, which is what she's trying to do, as a purchaser. Hmm. By the way, that's also what the Biden administration is trying to do. And in fact, that's what they did do during COVID. Um, just to, to make a little link, but it's important because I actually make this link in the book, Masks. COVID hits. We don't have any masks. Why? Because we've been buying three cent masks from China and the Chinese, understandably, in the middle of a pandemic, want their masks back. Um, By the way, three cents is dumping anyway because the raw materials are like five or six cents. But the Biden administration came in and said, "Okay, you know what? We're going to use the power of the federal government to purchase from a diverse range of suppliers these masks. That's what she's trying to do in California. She's saying we're going to use the University of of California system, ultimately the public school system, as a purchaser because there is now this diverse marketplace. That's how you start to get to a different system. I could go on, but but this is where the change happens. Hmm. And, you know, just to also keep it familiar for for listeners, you do talk about, um, like, uh, groups of farmers, farming collectives, Essentially, absolutely cooperatives. That, cooperatives, I should say, that come under some pretty familiar names like o- Land of Lakes and and, Spr- mm-hmm. and Ocean Spray and Welch's. Um, so when we come back, though, uh, Rana, I want to talk to you more about sort of the the global implications or what we stand more about what we stand to gain or possibly even lose as you know localizing and the economy continues, hopefully apace. We'll be back. This is on point. Hi, it's Meghna Chakrabarty, host of On Point, the show that brings you thoughtful conversations to help you make sense of the world. For recommendations of shows you won't want to miss and to get a peek at what the team is working on, subscribe to the On Point newsletter at onpointradio.org. This is On Point. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. A couple quick housekeeping things. First of all, if you haven't already, you should subscribe to our new On Point newsletter. We promise not to bombard your inbox. This is a once a week newsletter. It's a peek into a future show, an invitation for you to contribute and a selection of show picks from our producer. Again, it's a once a week newsletter, but it's super informative. And I encourage you to sign up at onpointradio.org. And in addition, coming up a little later in this week, we're going to be doing a show about chess a massive cheating scandal in in the world of chess and how digital disruptions are also or digital technology is also disrupting this ancient game as well so we want to hear from you if you play chess do you watch chess actually do you, do you watch chess online or 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 on Twitch how has the game changed for you as uh, the world of online chess has grown so dramatically uh and do you know about this chess scandal that's rocked uh, the the world of the game. Call us at 617-353-0683. That's 617-353-0683. We're going to be talking about chess and how it's changed later this week. Today, I'm speaking with Rana Faruhar. She's a global business columnist and associate editor at the Financial Times, CNN global economic analyst as well. We are talking about Rana's new book, Homecoming, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World. Now, Rana, I want to just, uh, again, play a little bit of an interview that you did with someone who you reference in your book, uh, Lori Wallach. Is it Wallach or Wallach? Wallach. 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 Yeah. Okay. Director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. And she told you that the pandemic was proof that the U.S. economy needs more diversified production. If there's any upside to COVID, 
It's that everyone in this country actually saw personally lived experience the downside of the hyper globalization regime the pandemic brought at home. This is why we have to make things. This obsession with single sourcing, hyper globalized efficiency, just in time, super corporations is simply not reliable for supply chains. Well, I want to bring Jack Beatty into the conversation now. He's on points, news analyst. He's been listening patiently thus far. Hello there, Jack. Hello, Megna. Hello, Rana. So, hey, Jack, Jack. So, Jack. Uh, you know it, what? What Ron is saying, and what many others have been saying for for a while as well, it makes a lot of intuitive sense, right? Um, Hyper efficient is also um, actually quite a delicate system. But do you see any potential drawbacks or downsides to um, the sort of pulling uh, pulling in? Maybe isn't the best word, but the more um, localizing of certain parts of our economy and supply chains. Well, as I was reading this brilliant, uh, spirited book, uh, I was listening to the (laughs) reporting of President uh, Xi's address to his party conference uh, over the weekend. And, uh, Rana, he seemed to be taking a page out of your book by way of of (laughs) Chairman Mao's little red book. Xi using the phrase self-reliance in science and technology five times. Meanwhile, uh, I see a headline in the Wall Street Journal, the U.S. aims to, quote, cripple China's ability to make advanced chips. So here's localomics uh, with a vengeance in these two great powers. And I'm just wondering, is localomics a kind of suburban, polite word for begot thy neighbor, for protectionism, for Mm. a return Mm to the pre-Bretton Woods world of, of the 1930s, where nations, you know, I, I think uh, yeah. uh, Fortress China, Fortress America. What do you say to that? So it's a, it's a great question, and uh, it is something that I talk about in my book. I don't think so, and here's why I don't think so. Um, Putting aside Xi and his political rhetoric, which frankly is a whole nother thing, because as you as you both probably know, in China, there's what is said for for the public and for posturing, you know, like in, as in politics here. And then there is the five year plan, which is essentially the 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 party puts out every five years what it is going to do. It never veers vectorally from that. And the last five-year plan was basically putting forward this idea that that Magna has explored about dual circulation. And what that means in the context of China is that China wants to, as the U.S. does, change some of the imbalances in the economy. Instead of just being the factory of the world and exporting everything and sort of taking in cheap capital and providing cheap labor, they want to move up the economic food chain, too. They want to both produce and consume. So they're kind of at this moment in their economy, they're a bit like I think of them like the U.S. in the post-World War II period, where there's a big single language market that has a lot of room to run. And so in an ideal world, I think China would hub more production and consumption at home and within the region so that they would be producing and consuming as part of a sort of an Asian regional bloc. I can see a European bloc. I can see an American bloc. Actually, it was very interesting. Christia Freeland, who was the deputy prime minister of Canada, gave a fascinating speech at the Brookings Institution last week, basically saying, yeah, you know, we need a new, almost like a new kind of NAFTA, more inclusive, where we're all participating in regional innovation that kind of lifts labor and wages rather than just outsources things. Now, that's the ideal world. However, you are right that there is a risk for in tit for tat trade wars. But I would I would step back and say, you know, I don't think the WTO has been working for for a long time. And I think that part of that is down to a willful blindness about the fact that we do have different political systems out there in different political economies. Values matter. I remember going to China once um, about 15 years ago, 
and having a conversation with the head of a, a wind company, a Danish wind company there. And they were in the number one spot in China at the time. And I said, how are things going? What's the future going to be like? And this guy said, the CEO, he said, well, it's pretty good. I think we're going to be in fourth position in the next five years. And I said, why is that good? And, you know, and, and also, how do you know so precisely? And he said, well, that's what Beijing has told us. So, you know, the rules were always different. The Chinese economy is different. Um, I think more regionalism and more hubbing of production and consumption locally, putting manufacturing and consumers, you know, together is where the future's headed. It's where technology is headed, too, and we can get into that. Mm. Jack, do you want to respond to that? Is is this is it is it sustainable though? Is it durable? Uh, you know, we've heard yeah. from foreign yeah. pol policy experts saying uh, one election can change America's whole approach to the world, as, as the 2016 election uh, did, uh, in terms of foreign policy and security policy. Is this change toward localomics proof against the next? election? Uh, or is this just something that can be, you know, as as in, you know, policy toward NATO, policy toward mm. uh, South yeah. Korea? Is it something that can just be, be stopped because the Republicans come back and they want yep. to go back to uh, Paul Ryan economics? Well, you know, that, <laughs> that's, I'm glad you said Paul Ryan economics because, I, you know, as you know, ironically, there's not that much air I don't want to say tr between Trumponomics, but more between Bob Lighthizer, who was the former USTR under Trump, who I think of as a thoughtful person and really not part of what I think of as the Trump universe. There's not too much air between his trade policy and those of Catherine Ties, who's the Biden USTR. And they're part of, I think, a very much bipartisan shift towards, look, the economic pendulum swing. For 70 years, the pendulum has been swinging towards neoliberal, hyper-globalized, hyper-financialized, you know, make things as cheap as possible. And who cares if wages go down or, you know, jobs in, in mm. every sphere are destroyed. That policy is now tapped out. So so the pendulum is shifting back. Now, Republicans and Democrats will will t tweak this in different ways. The Trump administration came in with the blunt force tariffs. Mm -hmm. I think the Biden administration is being much more thoughtful about saying, let's think about an industrial policy um, and, and how should we uh, connect the dots between educators, job creators? You know, how should we use federal purchasing power to underwrite markets? Much more thoughtful. I think there are some thoughtful Republicans, too, on this. Marco Rubio is actually you know, pretty thoughtful on industrial policy. Uh, but you're right. It remains to be seen. And things can change in this country quickly. You're right. Yeah. Well, I mean, on the other hand, the Biden administration hasn't been fearful of making decisions that rile, extremely rile up China. I mean, the, True enough. the recent um, ruling on uh, banning sales of, uh, of chips made with any kind of U.S. equipment anywhere in the mm -hmm. world. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that that that's a. Uh, I on on almost Trump Trump Trumpy in in its boldness in terms of going toe to toe with China and the reason why I point that out is Jack has mentioned this in actually our editorial meetings before yeah. and I wanted to ask you Ron what you think about it because part of the gauzy dream of hyper globalization was also that interdependence would uh, yield an era of peace essentially yeah. because we simply relied on each other too much to go to war with each other. Yeah. Um, is there any <laughs> merit, remaining merit to that at all? Yeah. Well, you're talking about, you know, the golden arches theories, though, you know, the world is flat. Two countries with <laughs> the McDonald's will never go to war with another. And, you know, not naming any names here, but but that stopped working about the time that Yugoslavia <laughs> fell apart. Um, so, no, I don't think that free trade has made us freer. And, you know, I frankly always thought it was sort of Western hubris in some ways that that made us think that that would be the case. You know, as, as I say, when I'm in Asia, or Turkey, or any number of other countries. I, I'm not saying that their systems are perfect or desirable, but they're different and they've got their strengths, you know? And the idea that we all thought that everybody was going to miraculously just march along to the Washington consensus was really kind of arrogant. And, you know, I'm, I keep thinking back to that 
Bill Clinton's speech, you know, globalization is just inevitable. It's proceeding. There's nothing we can do. Well, actually, there's been many different kinds of globalizations, regionalizations and localizations throughout history. They're different each time. We actually can craft policies and make decisions as a society about how they how they look, um, you know, and how they work. And I think that's what's happening now with this this understanding that, you know, do we want to get um, if, if I'm in, sitting in Germany, do I want to get my energy from an autocrat that has started, you know, what may become a nuclear war at some point? No. Um, do I want to trade, uh, you know, get a really cheap cotton T-shirt that's made by tiny hands in a forced labor camp in Xinjiang? Maybe not. You know, there are values trade-offs here, and we do need to think about them. Mm. Jack, back to you. I'm wondering what you, you know, your response to what Ron is saying or any other aspect of um, this again, like complete understandable notion that our our fragile our current fragile systems needs need need a reset, and part of that reset is to bring you know, things home. Whether it's uh, uh, reshoring here in the United States, or here comes my favorite phrase um, of the year so far: friend shoring. <laughs> 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 but Jack, go ahead. Well, you know, uh, I, I think you bring out very well, Rana, the political cost, the the cost in resentment, even resentiment of of uh, mm -hmm. uh, free trade globalization, the left behinds, and you quote and you quote uh, Hannah Arendt connecting mm. totalitarianism with loneliness, with isolation, yeah. with people feeling uh, unconnected. Uh, to the, the 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 pulse of their countries, and of course, that's essentially the red map of the United States. That's that's yeah. the, all those counties that voted uh, against the Bill Clinton picture of uh, you know globalization is inevitable. Well, they they are fighting back, and they're fighting back all over the world. Can localomics? subdue the rancor? Can it take mm. some of the poison out of populism? Oh, boy. I love the way you phrased that. Um, it, it's so powerful. Yes, I believe it can. And that's why I'm so focused on work, work and income and jobs. I'm so uninterested in cheap. I'm so interested in raising wages, you know, because <laughs> basically mm. cheap is ju it just if you if you tally up the math. The the cost, the, the five cents, the 10 cents discount in a tomato is not making up for the fact that year on year um, between the housing bubble that we're in and the rate hikes that we've seen, the, the mortgage carry on an average home has gone up by 52 percent year on year. That's cheap is not helping us. What we need is an economy that's based not on asset bubbles, not on giant corporations outsourcing everything and, and creating a race to the bottom that will hit all of our jobs. Jobs mm. at some point, all mm. of our jobs, mm -hmm. which, by the way, one of the things that the pandemic showed us is and this is this is it's so, sort of a counterfactual that proves my point. Um, if you can do jobs anywhere, as one CEO said, if you can do it in Tahoe, you can do it in Bangalore. So get ready for the next wave of attempted white collar outsourcing of everything. That is a recipe for a revolution, I think. Yeah. And so we have to start thinking about enriching local ecosystems. So, Rana, we only have two and a half minutes left, and there's two final questions I really want to ask you. One is, sure. you know, in a sense, I can, I can imagine some listeners right now are like, these guys are just blowing smoke because, <laughs> no, because sure. the truth, yeah, the tr yeah, they're, yeah. they're Here's a fact that, I mean, the world is not flat. Everyone is not equal. Certain nations have certain competitive advantages, and that is simply how it is. And, uh, you know, for the past 50 years, the role of government has been to reduce the barriers so those competitive advantages could essentially work in harmony with each other. We're not going to change that reality. So are you asking for a change in the role of government here in terms oh, of... Oh, well, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, I think that part of the neoliberal pendulum having swung too far is too much private, not enough public. I mean, I, you know, I think many of us would agree with that. But let me also say, I'm not arguing for going from hyper-global to totally local. I mean, we're not going to all live on subsistence farms. It's about, it's about a balance between regional, between labor and capital, you know, finding mm -hmm. that, that middle ground. It's just our system is way too far out of whack. Um, and, and so that's that's really what I'm trying to get at. Well, so this brings me back to where we started with that stunning story that Richard Trumka told you about a mm. Clinton administration economic policy official knowing that a vast swath of America would feel pain for generations. What can we do? What needs to be done 
to be sure that essentially, you know, decision makers from that same elite set of America, you know, aren't crafting a new system with the presumption that uh, other Americans will just have to bear some different kind of pain. Uh, Yeah. Well, you know, I actually feel kind of optimistic about that, and I'll tell you why. Um, In this administration in particular, a lot of the decision makers in power, and I look at some of them in the book, people like Heather Boucher, Brian Deese, um, they're not coming from those circles. They're coming from a new generation of people that have lived some of that felt pain, and they have different ideas. Well, we'll see what co- what happens come the next presidential election, though, right? So, Rana Fruhar, the new book is Homecoming, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World. It's a terrific read. Rana, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Thank you, as always, Magna. Thank you. And Jack Beatty, On Point's news analyst. Jack, great to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Magna Chakrabarty. This is On Point. <laughs> 